You're listening to the Jam Pro Show all about movies. And today my guest is Academy Award nominated documentary filmmaker, Ed Perkins. And we're going to be discussing his brand new documentary entitled Princess, which will debut on HBO on August 13th. Welcome to the show, Ed. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to, to talk about our film. I am excited to talk about your film also. First, let's talk about why you decided to uh, do this documentary about Diana. Um, there, as you know, there's been many, many documentaries since she passed away almost 25 years ago, which is just mm -hmm. hard to believe. It just seems like it was yesterday. Um, but why did you decide to tackle this topic again and, and the subject again? It's a great question, and it's a question question we wrestled with actually for many years because this is a film that we've been talking about making for many, many years. Um, I mean, I guess, first and foremost, I've always felt and still do that this is one of the kind of defining stories of our time. And, you know, I never met Diana, but possibly like many of your viewers and certainly millions of people around the world, you know, I, I, I feel a sort of strangely personal connection to this story. There's something about... Diana or what she came to represent that I think got under a lot of people's skin and sort of became part of a collective understanding of who we were in some way. And I guess the sort of starting point for the film is to sort of ask why, you know, why was it that tens of millions of people came out and cheered Diana on when she got married to Charles back in 1981? Why was it that for the next 16, 17 years that she was on this very public stage, we all dissected everything she did, everything she wore, everything she said, everywhere she went. Um, and then I guess ultimately, why was it that after she died, there was this kind of extraordinary and unprecedented reaction to her death and this sort of collective grief um, and, and this sort of very public outpouring of emotion. Um, and so that's the kind of starting point when you're absolutely right. There have been many documentaries about her already made and I reckon this is probably one of the most told and retold stories in the past few decades. So we really did feel like we we had to feel confident that we had something new to offer, right? And and at least a new perspective. And I guess look, my, my feeling was that a lot of the documentaries that I've seen, um, and there are many good ones out there, I think they're sort of actively trying to kind of get inside Diana's head. They're trying to be kind of interior and trying to understand what makes her tick, um, trying to understand her psyche trying to understand how she was feeling or what her motivations for certain actions were. You know, all of that is really interesting and, and, and it's been done well in documentaries, but inevitably does involve a degree of speculation because we don't know exactly how she was feeling um, at certain, many parts of her life. And I guess for me, the part of the Diana story, the part of this bigger puzzle that I feel has been less explored and that is more interesting for me personally is not what does the story say about Diana, but what does Diana's story say about all of us? And so the whole point of this film, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, the reason we've decided to make it without headshot interviews and just relying on archive is in a sense to try to turn the camera back onto all of us and force ourselves to ask some difficult questions about, yeah, I, I, our relationship to Diana in the first instance, but actually more widely, our relationship to the royal family or to celebrity, which is obviously something that's still going on today. And I guess ultimately the thing that I'm sort of most interested in, which is kind of what was our role in this story? You know, because I don't think this was a story we just kind of passively observed happen. It seemed to be a story that lots of us actively participated in or felt we were participating in. And so I guess that 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 question about our own complicity in this story is a sort of central one that I think the film is trying to grapple with. You went, I mean, I love the, the perspective because there are no interviews. There's no, there's no one um, moderating it or narrating it. And you just used archival footage. And I thought that was very interesting. Now it had, I mean, your film's almost two hours long. How many hours did it take you to go through all of that footage to put this together? Because it really is from the beginning of our first awareness of Princess Diana, our Lady Di at that point, and all the way through to the very end. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, it, it, you know it's it comprehensive. It's totally, you know, from beginning to end. But there was new footage that I had never seen anywhere before. Mm -hmm. 
and in inter- and just you just it's footage with people just on the street talking about her a, a lot, which I thought also was very interesting. So how did you come across to all of this? I mean, some of it's footage we've seen, obviously. Yeah. But how did you come across all of this and how many hours uh, of footage did you have? And then how long did it actually take you? to put stuff Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right to say that this film sort of consciously avoids most of the kind of basic building blocks of traditional documentary. You know, normally with a film like this, you would shoot interviews with people that knew Diana and you would use their headshot interviews to tell the story. And then the archive would become kind of illustrative, sort of, we call it B-roll, sort of wallpaper B-roll that sort of illustrates the point that the interviews are making. You know, one thing that that approach does, and it can be brilliant, but it, it, Every time it cuts to a headshot interview with someone, it reminds me that actually we're not back 25 years ago, we're actually in 2022. And when these archive only films are done well, and I don't know if ours is, but when 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 I watch other people's films that I think are, are brilliant, that take a similar approach, they create this really immersive journey, you know, that the archive kind of works as a, almost like a time machine. It kind of picks you up, takes you back, into a moment in, yes, Diana's story, but actually probably in your own story, your own life as well, right? Because we all have these connections, these nostalgic connections to, 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 to these moments. And, and, and it doesn't let you escape. And, and the story kind of unfolds in the present tense. The challenge, as you say, is trying to kind of craft that. And I think one of the massive challenges for us specifically was that for almost two decades, Diana was one of the if not the most filmed and photographed people on the planet and so the sheer volume of archive was was kind of terrifying i mean we set our archive team the challenge of basically going and finding everything that had ever been filmed about diana which is a slightly naive request at the beginning because like hundreds and hundreds of hours i think close to a thousand hours of archive like very quickly came into the edit and i guess i felt it was our responsibility to watch through all of that. And so we really did painstakingly for, you know, the first six, seven months of the edit, we just watched archive all day long. I just sat there and watched eight, 10, 12 hours of archive a day. Often archive we've all seen before, you know, or, but I was trying to find within it things that spoke to me um, or that I found interesting or that I was struggling to understand that I also felt um, other people would would find kind of fascinating. The truth is with this story that this isn't a film about kind of twists and turns and revelations that we don't already know. We all know what happens in this story. Our objective was to offer a new perspective on that story. And so what I found myself often doing when I was looking at the footage was looking for subtext and looking for body language, you know, and often body language between Diana and Charles or Diana and her own. And I kind of came to see Diana a bit like a like a like a silent movie star from the old black and white movies you know from the kind of golden era and like there were large parts of her public life where she actually didn't say very much publicly and yet i think she somehow had this instinctive understanding of how to kind of tell her own private story publicly and 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 sort of involve us in her story and And um, I think you see that from a very early point when she's, you know, even as a 19, naive 19 year old, she just has this amazing ability to 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 understand the camera and how the camera works and and, and how to create imagery. Um, And I think she really did become a kind of a master of, of, of her own image in a sense. And so, yeah, I was often kind of finding myself like drawn into the camera, looking at body language, thinking, like what is happening here? What is she trying to say? And I'd often then talk to my editors and I'd say, is this what's happening? And they'd say, no, I think it's something else. And we sort of found that fascinating because in a sense, that is how we all consumed the story at the time. We were all always projecting our own hopes and dreams and fears onto Diana, onto onto this sort of canvas and, and making the story up and willing it into being. And So the film is hopefully giving audiences the space to come to their own conclusions and draw their own inferences and trying not to be too heavy handed about what we want audiences to take away. Um, But I do think there's something fascinating just about being forced to sit in that archive again. And and I hope that people as a result kind of see it afresh. Oh, you know, there were a lot of things, even though um, 
we have seen for well, many of us, like I can't speak for everyone, mm-hmm. but um, the early interviews, you know, that they uh, that Charles and Diana did when they were engaged and they were asked the question, "What do they have in common?" Yeah, I thought that was really, you know, even though I, after I saw that in real time, um, interesting to look at it now in this perspective. You're right, um, and and knowing what transpired, yeah. uh, it gives you a different viewpoint when you're looking at those early interviews and you're seeing they really didn't answer a lot of those questions. You know? I mean, yeah, it's a fascinating moment. There's two things I'd say about that. One is that the the moment that is often endlessly used from that interview is a sort of famous moment where Charles says, whatever love means, which has kind of been repeated endlessly. Right. One of the things we decided in our film was to try wherever possible to avoid the bits of archive that we have all seen endlessly. And so that doesn't appear in our film. I mean, actually lots of people who have seen the film afterwards sort of felt that it did, it was included in our film because you sort of just joined the dots and you think that you've heard it again, but it sort of freed us up actually to go into these interviews and find other bits that haven't been seen as widely. And that, that that's a good example of it. And the other thing I think, you, you, you know, you picked up on, which I think is so insightful is like, you know, this film works in large part because of what we now know, right? Like we are, we're hoping that people are able to bring their own hindsight to bear on this story. You know, we have all in the last 25 years through osmosis, if nothing else, just like consumed the analysis and reanalysis of the Diana story. Like we've all seen The Crown and we watched Spencer and we've read the books and listened to the podcasts. And so many of us have, have come at this story with an inevitable amount of kind of emotional baggage, for want of a better word. And we 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 sort of accept that and we want people to bring their own hindsight to bear. And so the point of this film is not just to kind of take audiences back and get them to relive the story. We're hoping that by giving audiences the space to bring their own hindsight to bear on this story, that they will also be able to kind of reframe it and see it afresh for themselves. At what point did you did you decide that was the way that you were going to go about this documentary? You know, was it after you started watching the archival footage that you decided that you weren't going to have a narrator, that you weren't going to do it in the usual way or, you know, prior yeah, I mean, to the start? Pretty, pretty or did early. You, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Pretty, pretty, pretty early. We decided on the form pretty early. I mean, I, I always feel like the form has to serve the story and the perspective that you're trying to tell. And so we knew the broad story, which was Diana's. We then were very clear about the new perspective that we wanted to offer up, which which absolutely is to try to hold a mirror back to all of us um, and, and and force this to, to be a film really about what we needed from Diana and, and, and what we continue to need from Monarchy, um, amongst other things. And, and then it's kind of the question is, well, what form will best allow us to get that perspective out? And it just felt that this archive only approach would would allow us to kind of explore some of those emotional truths that I think are still kind of lurking here because the truth is the archive was the medium that we all got to know or so many of us knew Diana through it was that it was the medium through which we ended up consuming her and her story and so it felt interesting to kind of go back to that footage and 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 force audiences to to be confronted with it again um, and not in a sense have anywhere to escape very interesting. I, I was telling a friend about it, uh, the documentary, and she asked me, she said, um, do they take a perspective on this? Do they choose sides in this documentary? And I said, no, it's not about that. <laughs> it's just about yeah. what transpired during, you know, during her lifetime. And um, well, yeah. go ahead. I'm really glad, I'm really glad your friend felt that way. I mean, we, we certainly, in good faith, have come at this film without an agenda. You know, we, we we are not trying and haven't tried to make a film that is either pro-monarchy or anti-monarchy or pro-press or anti-press or pro-Diana or anti, you know, that is not our objective. That doesn't mean that over the course of two years, we haven't developed our own point of view as filmmakers. But, you know, that point of view is, for me at least, is 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 really to kind of, as I say, hold the mirror back at me first and foremost and be critical of the way that I continue to, to consume stories and 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 it's about trying to kind of have a 
uh, you know, a, a, a grown-up conversation about the role that we all play in creating demand for certain stories, or perhaps the way in which we, and I say we, it's not everyone, but that large parts of society, many of us, turn these stories into almost like a type of entertainment, right? Like I think Diana's story for so long when she was alive was, it almost became a kind of national sitcom, a national soap opera. And, and you know, I guess one of the questions I hope the film can offer up is kind of, you know, we, we want the fairy tale, but at, at what cost, you know, at whose expense? And um, it's not about throwing out blame, it really isn't, but it's just about trying to to tackle what I think are the more complicated, complex issues that, that, that are in this film and continue to kind of rumble on today. You know, to use the press as, but you know, as much as she, I mean, if, you know, when you watch this, you go, oh my goodness, you know, she was just hounded constantly. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yet she knew how to use the press for her mm -hmm. own benefit. So it was a double-edged sword for her. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit. How did you feel about that? Because that comes out very clearly in the film. Well, I think it's, I think it's true. And I think it's, 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 probably the way that all people in public life, um, you know, have to, to sort of navigate that relationship. I don't think it was unique to Diana. I mean, I think most people in public life probably inevitably have to kind of, you know, sign this sort of Faustian pact where they, there's a certain interdependence and and it's a really tricky balance or it seems a really tricky balance to get right. Um, you know, I think there are times and people have often talked about the way that Diana used the press to get her own story out there. Um, I don't come at that, you know, cynically. I, I I understand why someone in public life might feel the need to do that. Um, um, but I, it clearly comes at a, at a price and with a risk. Um, I guess, you know, the, 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 the part of the puzzle that I'm most interesting in, most interested in is, is sort of our, us, the public and our, our role in that. But, you know, we haven't i don't think diana is perfect i i i think she was fallible and flawed like all of us and i think you know perhaps one of the one of the interesting things after she died was i mean there literally were um um you know she was sort of there was a sort of canonization process almost you know very quickly after she died and and uh, shrines were kind of literally being built you know on the streets of london and you know one of the one of the i think problematic things about that was that we sort of forgot that that actually we all rather liked the fact that she wasn't perfect and made mistakes in public and that was one of the sort of things that was so disarming about her was that she she had this extraordinary position in public life and yet she did seem to sort of make mistakes and she was um uh sort of honest about her own shortcomings and you know i i, I sort of i felt it was important to kind of bring that back up in some sense. Um, it just feels like a more complex, more realistic picture. So the film is not a critique of Diana in, a, in that in any way, you know, I, I actually come out feeling, you know, very sympathetic to to all the central characters, for want of a better word, the, cent the people in this story, because I think that is a very difficult life to live. Um, and, and you know, if the film is critical of, of anyone, it is, you know, first and foremost of myself and, and more widely, you know, us, us, the public, and 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 as I say, how we turn these these stories into a, I guess, a sort of form of entertainment for our own consumption. I I, I totally agree with you. Um, when I when I was again describing the documentary to my friend, I said it's a tragic story. That's all. It's, you know, it's just the whole thing is tragic, and we, you know, we all had, you know, when she got married, and you know, we all we did. We wanted the fairy tale. Everybody wanted the. Fairy but uh, not all fairy tales and you know they always usually end they lived happily ever after as you wrote it in, in showing this film too but of course not so I recently just moved to Santa Barbara and I um, joined the uh, Santa Barbara Polo and Racquet Club and I have gone to see Prince Harry play Polo here and um, it's same you know there's a lot of criticism obviously about him stepping down in a way um, but I think after you know, seeing what happened to his mother and how he was you know, hounded, with the, how she was hounded with the press, um, that he made the right decision to come to a place that it maybe isn't hounding him quite as much, although his property has been broken into several times, which is rather scary. Um, and so I've talked to people from England and they have really a different 
attitude towards Prince Harry stepping down. And I know you don't address this in your film, but I'm going to ask you as a Brit, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Um, you know, I don't think it's, it's probably not helpful for me to offer any um, specific thoughts as to whether I think what they did was right or wrong. I mean, in, in a sense, you know, I, I think Harry specifically talks about a fear of history repeating itself. And, and I given that the film is in a, in a way a sort of critique of this constant speculation i'm sort of um nervous about being drawn into offering more um look i guess one, one thing i would say is that when harry and Meghan left the uk and moved to the us um it was sort of at the beginning of when we were making the film and i think you're right i think there probably is a you know there are very polarized opinions in the uk but sort of broadly, there probably is a slightly different viewpoint here to, 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 to the US. But the thing that really struck me was that when they moved from the UK to the US, in the UK at least, like for days and weeks, it was literally the only thing it seemed like everyone was talking about. It seemed like the story and everyone had incredibly strong and polarized views on it. You know, no one I talked to was actually apathetic. You know, they might pretend to be, but as soon as you dug, they had a viewpoint. And um and and people were taking sides and you know it did feel again like the sort of sitcom had come back to life and it reminded me very much of like of 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 the way that the public were um interacting with the story of diana's life when she was alive like there was this constant debate this constant chatter this often you know it's sort of argument um uh, over you know 15 16 years of her life where we were dissecting everything and people were having very very strong opinions and and so part of the film is about trying to kind of bring to life that debate again you know in terms of the links to to modern day events you know i i, I do think there are ways in which you can see this story as a kind of an origin story um you know for things that have happened more recently. And, and, and perhaps Harry and Meghan is, is part of that, but I think it's wider than that. It's about, you know, the public's relationship to the monarchy and, 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 um, and how that continues to evolve. And, you know, I guess if there's one sort of central question I ended up thinking a lot about when making this film, it was really about like, what, what does the public, you know, at least in Britain, what do we want from our royal family? You know, what, what do we want them to be? And, and there's this kind of paradox at the heart of that, which is like, do we want them to be just like us? Do we want them to be normal and transparent and approachable and relatable? Or actually, do we want something else? Do we want our royal family to be kind of other and different and special and sort of retain that sort of magic element, you know, the kind of stardust? And, and the truth is that we probably want both of those things all the time. We probably can't have both of those things, but we want both of those things and perhaps you know, perhaps Diana was sort of able uniquely to sort of walk that tightrope and be both those things, be both um, able to relate to normal people and, and, and also sort of sprinkle the magic stardust. And it's no surprise, I think she was called the people's princess after her death. I think she was able to kind of carve out that really unique perspective. So I guess what I would say is I, I don't want to prescribe the links between this story and Harry and Meghan for audiences. I think there are things there, there are reflections and echoes that I think viewers have already told me that they're taking from that, but I, I'm trying to make a film that is giving viewers the space and respect to kind of draw their, their own conclusions. It, yes, it does, but you, you're right. You do think about it when you're watching this film, you know, obviously uh, the parallels and the things that are yeah. there and obviously the long-term effect that uh, her death had on Harry and William. Um, it's going to be interesting after the Queen passes away, um, what's going to happen. I mean, Americans are fascinated with the monarchy. We, we love it. <laughs> it's, I don't know, maybe we're disappointed that it's we're still not a part of it. Who knows? But uh, we're always fascinated by what goes yeah. on uh, with the royals. And, uh, you know, but it will be interesting to see what happens after the death of the Queen. It definitely will. And look, I, I went to university. I was at college in um, in UNC, uh, Chapel Hill, for four years. I was oh, a Thai. So okay. I uh, was always surprised at, at, at how fascinated um, Americans were with specifically the British royal family. But you're right. I mean, we are in this sort of strange moment of, you know, potential flux. And I think that's why I think this this story is important now because you know we haven't we consciously haven't made a historical documentary you know yes the events of 
that are, you know the recapture in the film happened 25 30 years ago but actually i really believe that this story has more to say now than at almost any other point and um i think that is because of more recent events as we talked about but it's also as you say because at some point inevitably you know there will be change at the top you know the sort of elizabethan era will come to its natural end and and there will at that point be a change and i think that these sort of big questions that the film is is trying to offer up and grapple with about this relationship between public and monarchy and what we want from the monarchy and how, what a sort of difficult and often complex relationship and tightrope that is to walk um you know i think all of that will inevitably kind of <laughs> come to the fore again. So um, I do think there are insights and, and things that we can t take from Diana's story and that uh, feel very relevant actually to, um, to 2022. I agree, I agree. Ed, thank you so much. Uh, this has been enlightening and I wish you much success with The Princess, which will be debuting on HBO on August 13th. So thank you so much. I look forward thank to you, having you back with your next project. <laughs> Sorry. I will. I will very soon. Yeah. But lovely to chat. And thanks so much for uh, for uh, all your interest. And, and um, yeah, we can't wait to uh, hear what your um, your listeners think. Great. I look forward to it. Take care. Have a wonderful day.